second and concluding session of this World Billiards Championship final of 2023, where Peter Gilchrist is a little over 300 points in front. He was 300 ahead after the first session at 741 to 441. Really intriguing stuff. Gilchrist looking to build on this lead. David Corsier, the defending champion, looking to erode that deficit and get back onto level terms in double quick time. Now, joining me in the commentary box for the next few moments is the tournament controller, Frank Bradley, who's been here for almost a week now, officiating at the English Open and then this big world championship. And yes. Frank, has everything gone smoothly? Very, unbelievably smoothly so far. Um, everything has finished on time. We haven't had uh, any really big difficulties apart from a couple of illnesses which have uh, but we've managed to get over those without any real problems now that's a lovely long journey from uh, Peter Gilchrist yes he averaged in the first session well below his norm 25 but the average for Corsi was 14 now when you consider that when he won this last year his average in the final was 50. That's a, a big deterioration. Yeah. For some reason, he just hasn't been on song in this final at all. He's um, struggled. Uh, I had a brief chat with Peter beforehand, and he was saying that the table was playing a little differently, quite heavy, he thought. Yeah. And he thought that maybe that, plus the added nerves of being in a world final, that contributed to a standard that these two normally don't produce oh i know normally the standard these two produce is absolutely out of this world uh, we've been uh, very fortunate all week with uh, some of the great play that we've seen very few of us can ever hope to attain this sort of standard of the game it's a, a good occasion also for the referee chris ellis who's involved in his first world final that's correct yes we the it was a choice really between chris and kevin christie and kevin has done a world final before so and he won't mind me saying this but uh, chris is getting on a little bit more than kevin is <laughs> and so kevin has a lot more chances the other referee who was also considered would have been Stephen Harrison, who hasn't been refereeing all that long, but has come on leaps and bounds and is one of the best referees we've got. And he is out there at the moment because, of course, he's the marker for this. He's the marker, indeed, yes. So, And he's enjoyed the week. He's been here all week, as has Chris, and they have both seem to have enjoyed it immensely. So I must ask you, Frank, have you been involved in billiards for many, many years? Uh, too many. <laughs> uh, yes, I first started playing when I was 18, and I'm 78 now, so <laughs> that's 60 years. Highest break? 184. Very impressive. Uh, well, that was when I was a lot younger. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I could do that now. I could still just about do 100. Now, will this, this come off? This is a masse from uh, Peter. Oh, and he's missed it. He's gone too, he's done just too, he's just got into it a bit too much and it's turned before it got to the red too far. So... We keep anticipating a comeback from Corsia. We keep anticipating fireworks from Corsia. As yet, they've not occurred, but everyone I've spoken to says it's only a matter of time. Well, you never know with David. Um, he got beaten um, in Australia and didn't play well all the way through that game. Whereas normally he, he, he's... He's a very strange billiard player. He doesn't play like anybody else at all. He, he's more happy um, with uh, open play than any of the other top players. Most of them struggle with the open play and their intention is to get to the top of the table. 
where they can score very happily. Well, he flashed that pot in very confidently. Yeah, but unfortunately, he's put the white in a football position. And that's what caused him to miss it. He didn't have the position at the end of that red because he struck the white as well as potting the red. He just didn't have the position for the next shot. So many breaks have gone in over the course of the championship and yet in the first session they were in short supply. Gilchrist had the highest of the match so far, 193, also made a 102. But yeah. Corsier's scoring by his standards was very restricted. Well, he's, he hasn't had a century break, and that's not at all like David. David, no, you're talking about 200 uh, on the trot, you know, two or 300, and then another 200, and that puts opponents in such a lot of difficulty. Once somebody's got themselves five or 600 ahead, it's almost impossible to catch up. And uh, he's getting himself into a position now where it's going to be very, very difficult to catch up because Peter Gilchrist is such a great player. And if you give him a big start, you're in real trouble. <coughs> I've noticed as well in this game Peter is taking more time than he usually does and is making more sure of his shots. Um, and that has probably um, rankled a bit with uh, David because he likes just to get on with the game as quickly as you possibly can. I refereed him in one match where his average shot time was just under seven seconds. Yeah, that's <laughs> flying. <laughs> oh, he scored 1,441 points in an hour and a half. And of course, his opponent was scoring as well occasionally, but he had a 489 and 602 in that match. And that's phenomenal. The speed at which he thinks. But well, Peter's certainly got on top here, though he's played quite a poor shot there, and which makes it much more difficult to get the in off, because he's got to play a little bit of stone or screw on this in off, probably. But being Peter, he just gets it. <laughs> I think another substantial inning may be here, and he would be very much the favourites and that wasn't the case before a ball was struck oh no no but um, Peter is a very very capable player no matter who he's playing against he has always got a good chance and I mean against most of the players here it's almost a certainty the same with any of the top four players here uh, the second ranked players very rarely ever beat them and the third ranked players never do. <laughs> it's such a difficult task to beat these players because they're so very good at the game and they know exactly which shot to play in every circumstance. He's going to, uh, he's going to play the uh, drop cannon now to try and bring the red to the top of the table and uh, put the yellow in a good position as well. Not been as good a drop cannon as he would have liked, but the drop cannon is never a certainty. The great Australian player, Walter Lindham, always preferred not to play the drop cannon if he could. He'd rather play the in-off yellow to put the yellow behind the spot and then play the pot red, get down there. You want to detect a Merseyside accent there? You do indeed. I'm originally from Liverpool. Uh, surprisingly, I actually went to school with two of the Beatles. <laughs> Fantastic. Please tell me more. <laughs> 
Oh, that's true. They, they were both at school with me. Um, Which two? We, we, we're desperate to know. <laughs> it was... Uh, <laughs> It was George Harrison and Paul McCartney. We we went to the Liverpool Institute School. Um, oh, he's missed. He's missed the enough. Uh, and um, so did one or two quite well known people. But Paul McCartney bought the school after uh, after it was closed, and he um, it was now the Liverpool Institute for the Performing Arts. Now, that was a really good pot using the rest. It was a very good pot. And he's at the point where, I'm not saying that was a must make, but it was a very important make. It certainly was. And uh, the thing with David is he's probably the best potter amongst all the top players from any distance. Oh, now he's got to miss that one. <laughs> Commentator's curse again. <laughs> Frank, you've been here 10 minutes and you've got the commentator's curse already. I don't think anyone's caught it quite that quickly before. So you're in the record books for that. Oh, dear. It's a really strange dynamic because Gilchrist must be loving this. And yet, in many yeah. respects, he must be having to control his emotions because he must be really surprised by the way things have gone. Oh, Betty, I'm, I'm sure he's absolutely shocked. Um, he would not have expected David to play so poorly because it's not exactly David's first final. He's, he's won the final of the world a few times and yet he seems to have um, almost fallen apart with the nerves of the occasion. And let's not underestimate that this is such a, a mental game. All Q sports fall into that category. They do. And to be honest, normally both of these players are very good mentally. Peter especially is, I think. So Peter Gilchrist goes over the 800 point barrier. Uh, We mustn't get too giddy, though. As you can see from the clock, there's still over two hours to play. Yep. David just needs to get one really good break in to give himself confidence that he can actually catch up. Uh, but David is very capable of a three, four hundred break, as we know. And um, if he did get that, that would then really make it a game at the moment it's all Peter yes right now I think the most likely Beatles song that David might be singing is help <laughs> yes I think you're quite, really quite right uh, it's been a hard day's night so far all, you can't yeah. stop me now you can't stop me <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> do I have to put up with this <laughs> Well, you're the tournament controller. You can have me throw down, Frank. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't do that. No. No, the best thing you can do as a tournament controller is try and keep on everybody's side so that nobody feels left out and nobody gets into difficulties of any sort. Talking about another sung title from the Beatles era, and I think it applies here. What a difference a day a makes. makes. Yeah. David Causier yesterday put together a 517 break on this table. I know. <laughs> and he didn't really look like missing then till he managed to line them up and pop the red with the yellow, and the yellow followed through. But there you go. That's the sort of thing that can happen, even when you're playing well. Matthew Lawrenson said, what about welcome to our afternoon movie? Honey, I shrunk the pockets. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that wouldn't be bad, would it? Yeah. Oh, dear. I think for me, they're all shrunk <laughs> when I play. 
But the deeper into the match we go, and if Gilchrist can keep Corsier at bay, Gilchrist will free up, and then you'll probably see his standard get back to normal. Yeah. I mean, that's a lovely shot. A cannon off the cushion and put the two balls together in such a position that it's a cannon now is unmissable and it's easy enough to play a couple and then, oh, he's going to play another one now, I think, and put the red over the hole. But by, uh, often enough, by those little tiny cannons, you can get yourself into very good positions uh, where even sometimes where it looks very difficult to get that good position. And he's now in perfect top of the table. <coughs> so he'll have, he may have to play a bit of postman's knock, where the... Um, oh, oh, no, he's playing... Yes, he still might have to. He, he's going to have to play the long part now and then get himself into a position where he can get the cannon onto the yellow or the pot red into the opposite pocket. Yes, he's played for the uh, cannon, and this position they call postman's knock because when the um, the ball comes off the yellow, well, he's not played it that well. Normally, you try to hit it full ball, so that you get a double knock, and your your cue ball comes out away from the cushion and leaves you nicely on the pot red and the yellows or the. The opponent's cue ball stays on the cushion. Yep. Well, Frank, thank you very much for joining us in the commentary box, and thank you very much for all of your hard work this week in enabling this fine tournament to go ahead so smoothly and efficiently. <laughs> thank you. Our new right-hand man is Peter Sheehan. Welcome into the commentary box, Peter. Thanks, Phil. Everyone's talking about the standard of this match. Are you surprised? A little bit, but I think there's um, there's huge mutual respect between these two players. They've been played that many times, especially in so many finals. So they're both fully aware of you know what both players are capable of. Uh, yeah, but it's, it's very cagey, especially the first session. Before we concentrate on the billiards, Frank was just telling me he was at school with the Beatles, two of them, George Harrison and Paul McCartney. P yeah. McCartney, sorry. I think, yeah, I think he went to, uh, went to school with a few famous people. Frank's got some good stories. So, is this lead at the moment getting into a worrying position for Corsia? It is, but you know, Dave can just, he's, he can just switch it on at a toss of a coin, you know, three or four hundred points. Lee, there's nothing really because Dave scores, scores so quick. Uh, but he looks very uh, frustrated. I spoke to him at the, at the interval and he's quite frustrated. He's just not gone his way. The balls are running um, awkward for both plays, really. Um, Peter had a five or six awkward covers um, on drop, drop cannons, etc. So um, the balls haven't run kindly for, for both plays, really. So they're not really flowing. And Peter's playing very deliberately. And I, I think Dave's getting a little bit frustrated at the moment. I think it's the same the world over in any particular sport if you've got someone who's right at the the top of their game with abundant skill and suddenly they have a bad time of it a bad match a bad session whatever it must come as a real shock to the system well yeah well it's, it's been such a long week you know yesterday we played seven hours in total um and then again today the, the, the final was five hours so that's that's a hell of a long time to try and maintain concentration so i think it's just it's human nature to have a bit of a dip maybe in concentration or He's not feeling 100% today, who knows? Is it physically demanding? It can be, yeah. I mean, we've been playing, playing it all week, and um, so I say some days we've been playing six, seven hours a day, and you're on your feet all day. And, you know, the snooker players are selling you the same. You, you need to maintain that level of concentration. It's, it's difficult and it's draining. And you know, you, I don't think many of us are spring chickens, so, you know, sore backs and et cetera, and sore knees. But yeah. I was in the commentary box earlier on with the other losing semi-finalist here, Rob Hall, and asked him about his thoughts on the week. I'll do the same with you. Semi-final, 
happy or frustrated? Happy, um, well, happy-ish, you know, I've put a lot of work into this. Um, so I've, I've only returned to the game from the last, uh, I had 18 years away from the game, I came back in 2021, started playing again. Um, and basically what happened, my good friend Andrew Higginson, he was on the snooker tour, he persuaded me to start playing again. So I did and started practicing again. I started competing again in 2021, end of 21, yeah. And I reached the final, I beat Peter in one event and then another another event. And so I've, I've started uh, doing really well and I've won my first world ranking event in Leeds in August, just gone. Um, so I've come into this this event um, really hoping to you know to go deep into it. And I put a lot of work into it. I've um, I've been practicing at a new a new facility called the Northwest Snooker Academy in Liverpool, um, which has got four star tables. Uh, it's absolutely fantastic condition. So it's it's certainly sharpened my game, my game up coming into this event. And it's uh, it's done me the world of good. But I ran into Peter in the semi final. He was absolutely magnificent last night. He uh, he didn't really give me a sniff. Um, but today he's, he struggled like hell. You know, it's the way it goes. Big shot coming up here potentially to that distant. Yes, nicely done. Nicely done. Yeah, that's Jim Williamson Open. You won in August. You beat Peter in the final, didn't you? 387 to 397. Sorry, 587 to 397. 90 minute final. So it must have been a, a pretty good standard. Yeah, it was a good. They got a good start. I'm quite a quick player. Peter's a quick player. And I think they made it a 180 early doors. And then I managed to maintain that lead during the whole of the game, you know, so it was, it was a big thing for me, good achievement to get my first proper world ranking win. Uh, I did win the English Amateur Championship in April um, just this year as well, that was a, my first big win coming back, so uh, I'm really enjoying playing and practicing and that, it's just like took over my life again, so I'm really enjoying it. So the advice given to you by Andrew Higginson proved to be correct? Yeah, yeah, he's, uh, well, he knows he's talking about Andrew, so. Pretty good, Chris, <laughs> Dave will be itching to get in now. Still plenty of time, yeah. Lots of time to go. Everyone I've spoken to has said sooner or later, Corsia will catch fire. We're still waiting, but there is time. Well, there's plenty of time. I mean, the form Dave's shown this, this week is just phenomenal. I think last night against Rob, he had a 5-12 and a 2 9, -9 back to back. It's just phenomenal on this table, which... As well, these these super fine clots on the stars, you know, you've got to be so bang on. Uh, he's, he just blew everyone away. He's played this week, but today he's, he's he just doesn't seem to be on it for whatever reason. Could be uh, could be tired as we, but yeah, he's more than capable of just banging in a three or four hundred in twenty minutes, and it's it's, it's, it's an even game then. Alan Gibson on our chat asks you: Are you going to watch Everton beat the Reds, Peter? I certainly hope so, but I'm not not holding up much hope. So you're a blues man, are you? I am for me, for me sins, yes, yes. Much like John Parrott. Yeah, John. Yeah, I used to know John back in the day. Yeah, he's a good lad, John. Good as well. There's also a referee on the snooker circuit called Colin Humphreys. Yeah, I know Colin well, yeah. And he always goes through that ritual where he puts the blue on the table. I think it's first. <laughs> it's every single frame he re-racks the blues on first. Colin plays in our, our league team, the billiard team on a Monday night, so I see Colin quite regular. He was, uh, he's just come back on the city. I think he had a bit of some health problems. He's um, he's back on the ref and circuit now, so he's been at the last few events, I think. Yes, he was at the British Open in Cheltenham recently that we covered. 25. So this will reduce the deficit to under 400 points. When you think about like Dave, I find even though we're not paying a full pace, if Dave's flowing and he's, you know, he's, he's at the top of the table, he's making breaks, you're talking five and a half, six minutes for a hundred break. So you look at the time that's left. Um, it's, there's plenty of time for Dave to come back into this. But it's a, both players are feeling the pressure because it's a world final at the end of the day. 32. We know about the game being massively popular in the Middlesbrough area, what about Merseyside? Um, there is quite a few. There's quite a, a number of players in the, in, in the, in the local competitions. Um, Chris Kelly, he does. Uh, he organises some good local comp uh, competitions and events. The North West Merseyside Championships and uh, like handicap competitions. So it's quite a quite a healthy setup, really. And we all travel to the, the ABCs on the EABA circuits as well. Uh, quite a few of us play in World Billets events as well. So yeah, it's quite promising. Thank you. 
Yeah. Got the hand out of the way in time on that one. He's a bit awkward. I think he's on cushion first, actually. No. It's not getting going at all. And frankly, that wasn't really close, was it? No. Caught far too much of his opponent's ball. So, Peter, obviously, we are being watched around the world by people who are entranced by the skill level of these guys and the history of the World Billiards Championship. Some of the people who are watching might be new to the sport, so can you give us a, a potted summary of the rules? Yeah, basically, obviously, we've got three balls. Each, each player has their own cue ball, with the, uh, the white and the yellow. And obviously, the spotted... Uh, cue balls we can see the spin because I think on the job say about 90% of the shots that are played in billets are used a bit some side is used um, the scoring pattern is there that's a cannon there's two points for that when what your cue ball hits the, the red and the yellow or the other your opponent's cue ball in either um, sequence doesn't matter what puts them first pot red is there is three that goes onto the red spot or black spot for snooker fans um, and in ops as well um, where your cue ball would go would hit the other uh, that opponent's uh, cue ball or the red and go in its pocket and then the ball would be in hand in the D and you continue the break by doing that. Some of these shots look um, very very simple but the, the key to billiards is is to maintain that position and have a scoring shot the very next shot and maintain big breaks. That's where that's where the difficulty is and it requires a sublime touch and, and skill and knowledge to, to get good at this game. You, you need to practice it and for years and years and years. And also so this is a point we touched on in the first session. You require very steely concentration, don't you? You do, you know, yeah. It's it's a big break, you know, a three or 400 break uh, can take 20 minutes, 25 minutes. Whereas maybe say a, a snooker play, say obviously Ronnie making about four, seven or five minutes is ridiculous. But, you know, a, a snooker break essentially can take eight, nine minutes maybe. So, so to maintain, you know, a, a five, six, seven, that's why a thousand break under the, the ball command rules has never been done because it's probably going to take the best part of an hour, probably more, to do it. And to maintain that level of concentration would require like a superhuman effort, really. And you mentioned the, the ball climb rule. Basically, in a break now, a player has to cross the ball climb between 80 and 99. Yeah, um, we only that, that, that rule comes in like the, in this, the World Championship on the World Match Play. Um, on, on those points um, and basically what your cue ball has to cross the ball climb just have to go in and out but it has to cross the ball climb uh, to continue the break otherwise it's a foul stroke or you have to play a safety shot so it makes you know, it makes it a lot more difficult to make big breaks Alex has asked me how are you enjoying billiards well I'm like a fish out of water to be honest but I'm really enjoying the experience everyone's so friendly here so knowledgeable as well and these guys, well, they're not having the best of days by their standards, but yet they're still magical. In a way, it's um, it could have been like a, a landslide that for either player, the way they've both been playing. If David like got off to really a bit of a flyer, you know, he could have gone shot to a seven eight hundred point lead after after a, an hour and a half, and so could Peter. But the fact that it's quite close and it's, it's, it's even though it's like four hundred points uh, lead at the moment, that is nothing for Dave. Uh, it really isn't. It's plenty of time. So it's probably a good, better spectacle that it's going to be a close game and, you know, for, for any new Billy uh, fans watching. Now, when you say he's playing deliberately, is he playing slow by his standards or slow by normal standards? Slow by his, by Peter's standards, you know, and he's just taking that extra bit of time, uh, just being a bit more careful. Um, maybe the extra couple of feathers on a shot, um, walking on the table a bit more. Because he knows, basically, you know, Dave is so such a quick quick player, as is Peter. Um, and, you know, the, the more time that Dave's not at the table, 
he's going to be a bit more, he's going to get more and more frustrated because he knows time is still ticking, ticking down, and he, he knows he's going to have to come in with a three or four on the break, or maybe a couple of doubles to come back at, at Peter in this game, because the, the longer it goes on, Peter's holding the table, uh, the, the leaders start to get a little bit bigger, and Dave's going to start getting a little bit more edgy. But I think playing deliberately, as you say, by his standards, it's a tactic that you can't really fault. No, definitely not. It's, as I said, at the end of the day, it's the World Championship final, so he's got a, he's given every shot 100%. Um, and I said the longer it goes on, Dave's going to be a little bit more edgy, but he's more than capable of just, uh, as you said, as everyone says, as just coming in and knocking a 3 400 break in no time. We've dipped under the two hour to go, Mark. Is there ever a point where you take things for granted and you know you're okay? It gets to a point, and if you're playing a say, say a two-hour, three-hour match, um, you know that if you get to 500 points ahead, say, and there's 45 minutes to go, I mean, probably it's very high down. Like even if Dave would struggle. I mean, Dave in the group matches, Dave regularly scores six, seven, eight hundred points in an hour. You know, um, he's. he's um, He's such a prolific and quick score, as does Pete. Um, so, you know, you know, it can get to a point where you think that the, the, the match is won and, you know, the, the tension releases from your arm, you know you've won. It's like, I suppose, if you're in a snooker match, you were best than nine, you were, you were four nil up with, a, you know, with 60 left when there's only the colours left or something, you know, so. Before you joined us in the commentary box, I was chatting with Frank Bradley, the tournament controller, and we were making the point that the averages in the first session, 14 it's, it's for David Corsier. 14! I think at one point after about um, two hours, David scored 3 6 1, I think it looked. Which is just, it's just unheard of. I mean, it really is. I mean, Dave must average at least 600 an hour, easy, on, a, on, a, on an average day normally. Um, you know, so, but obviously it's such a, a cagey game because there's so much to stake. Fantastic shot there. You got on the right side of the reds, left a nice easy pot. Um, the, the yellow is in a good position. Ideally, where Peter would want to be now is on the right side of the yellow with the red in the spot and play a recovery cannon uh, to get perfect top. Push the balls back to the top of the table. He's gone high up the table now, so I think he's going to play in and off on the yellow and push the uh, maybe the yellow into a drop cannon position if it's not too thin. I think he's at the angles now, so he's going to play a slow cannon to lead the pot red. 63. And Corsia's problems today, well, they're even more surprising when you consider that in the tournament that preceded this, at this venue, he won the English Open. So it isn't in just this championship he's been playing well. It's been a case of playing well for a week. And yet, on the most important day, so far, he's not shown up. Yeah, it's a, it's a surprise. I mean, Dave's, you know, everyone calls him the machine and <laughs> he just blew everyone away this week in, in the in the warm-up event, the English, and I think he, he beat Pete in the final. And he's played so well. Uh, he's not three, four, five under breaks in all week. Staggering if you look at the, the breaks on the uh, the, the World Billies website. Yeah, and it's, it just goes to show every day is different and the balls haven't gone for him. Um, who knows what the reason is. But Peter's playing well. He's playing a really, really good match match billiards here. He's not flowing. He's not like he normally is. Balls at the top. He's playing the right shots, at the right time, and, and keeping Dave at the table. And that's what you've got to do to, to stop Dave from scoring. Could just keep him off the table. We were talking about this in the first session. If he wins today, Gilchrist will have won this world title in four different decades. I know we were just laughing about that. He's getting he's getting a bit old now, isn't he? But Peter's an absolute legend. He's um, a legend of the game. He's a, he's a great ambassador for billiards. He's such a great guy. I've known him since I was a, I was a teenager. Uh, he's got time for everyone. Um, and so he was he was world champion from 2000. Well, at least four times, but he won it in 2019 in, in Australia. Uh, and, he, and the sport can have a better ambassador for the for, you know for, 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 for billiards. He's just fantastic. Everyone loves him. He's he's such a joke, but he's always messing about. It's great company, and he's and he speaks to everyone all the events. He goes and speaks to all the players and etc. He's 
He's got no, there's no airs and graces about him, and he's a, a great guy. Oh, now then he could have got a bit of luck with that cannon, though. See, Dave's come to the table there, and he's, he's having to force the issue. He's not, he's had, he's had no uh, easy leaves, if you say. True. That's more than a few times that Gilchrist has fallen victim to mistakes when he's been screwing back. Yeah. Either a, a screw back cannon or a, a screw back in off. He missed a couple of them yeah. in the, the first session. And there again. They would be thinking in his head now, it's just under two hours to go. And then he just, it just he'll be thinking, oh, the match is starting now. And he'll just want to get flowing and... Even if it's a, a century or a double century. Oh, I can't believe he's missed that. I really can't. That is unbelievable. He's missed that by over an inch. And that is just so unlike Dave. Unless he's got a really bad contact. It, it, it seems to go really wide on, on, the, on the, the drop cannon there. We've cut away to him in his chair on several occasions during the day. And he's been sitting there, shaking his head, chuntering away, talking to himself. It must be an awful experience for him because he sets the bar so high and today, well, he's doing the limbo. He's, yeah, it's, it's, it's unbelievable how, how much he's struggling today, he really is. I say how talented Dave is, he's, he's the Ronnie O'Sullivan of billiards, he's, he's an unbelievable keyboard, absolutely. Some of the things he can do in a billiard table and the score and he's capable of is only Dave can do, he really is that good. Um, but today he's, he just doesn't seem to be with it, that's only just dropped in for Peter. Well, early in the first session, he missed a red to the middle pocket, Gilchrist, and we were talking about the fact it might well be a turning point, and yet it was hardly jumped on it all. No. And, and Dave's had a few chances now, and he's just not taking them. Normally, when you play Dave, you do tend to get chances because he goes for his shots, but he punishes you. If, you. if you make a mistake, he normally punishes you. And to have any chance of beating Dave, you've got to, you've got to score heavy every single time because you just know he's going to come back at you. You saw there a view of the, the match room here at the Landy Wood Snooker Club. It's halfway between Walsall and Cannock in the West Midlands of England. Peter, you've played a lot of places. This venue, this club, is absolutely top-notch, isn't it? It's, it's the best, in my opinion, it's the best club in the UK. It's absolutely phenomenal. Uh, the Northern Snooker Centre Leeds is, is a big favourite of ours. I think this just eclipses it. It's absolutely fantastic. The um, everything about it, the fixtures, the fittings, the uh, Paul, the the owner, he's spent no expense on the place. It's absolutely brilliant. The tables, the conditions, the air conditioning, uh, the staff are brilliant. Uh, they're friendly. The food's good. You can't complain. It's it's one of the best venues you played. It's as good as we went to Singapore last year um, and played at Rossi, uh, the Ronnie O'Sullivan uh, Academy, and that was just fantastic. Uh, but this is just. As, as good as I think it's absolutely fantastic. I love the memorabilia around the walls as well, you know. Yeah. So much gone into this. It's clearly the club of a snooker enthusiast. And I was talking to Paul to Paul in the the gap between the sessions and he was saying that in nineteen ninety one when the game went open he turned professional for a while and played snooker on the tour, then realised that he wasn't good enough to make it. But there's always snooker in your heart and having made a, a successful life as a businessman he decided to invest in this club and i'll tell you what he's done a wonderful wonderful job look at the the photographs there yeah they say he's been all that chat with paul and he's a lovely guy and he's, he's, he's so passionate uh, about snooker and i think billiards now he's he's, he's loved having us here this this week and he's really looked, looked after us and I know young Stan Moody's based here. Uh, he couldn't have, couldn't wish for better um, conditions of practising. It's a really fantastic club. It's a little bit awkward. He's got. I think he's got still got the in off. But you may have to uh, play thin. It's a bit tricky sometimes these shots. Not even be playing the uh, the cannon. At the the match between Joe and Fred Davis in your home city in 1948. Look at that. Chocker block. That 
looks like uh, St. George's Hall. Twenty-four. 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 Twenty-four.
Why calls you? Yeah, I, I do remember that, that shot. Just put that down to maybe early, early match nerves, but it's just continued, hasn't it? Yeah, the first 20 minutes, first half an hour, I don't think anyone was taking any notice of what was going on. As you say, it was a case of the two players bedding in, getting rid of the butterflies. But as the match has gone on, while Gilchrist has improved, Causey has remained mired, maybe in a little bit of self-doubt, I don't know, but he's certainly having a nightmare match by his standards. He is, and it's interesting, we were just chatting with Rob Hall before, and then we both lost in our semi-finals, um, myself to Peter and uh, Rob to Dave, and both Dave and Peter Gilkes were absolutely magnificent to both, against both of us. They, they beat us by over a 1,000 points in both matches, and they were flowing. Uh, it was it was magnificent to watch. And today they've, they've come and they're both struggling to make a struggling to make a 50 break. It's just bizarre. 63. But obviously, Peter's going to be the happier person now because he's five hundred points. It's a good league now. 103 minutes ago. To tell us the rationale behind what he's just done, the last few shots, potting his opponent's ball. Well, he's potted the um, Dave's ball. And obviously, Dave comes to the table now in hand and he has to play out of the ball. He can't just play directly behind the ball line. Yeah, so it's a safety shot. You'll only ever see your opponent's ball potted if it's by... Um, in error or if it's deliberate like like peter just did then as a safety stroke um because he just knows you know you double box someone um he could have gone attempted a, a mad cannon but the chances are he's going to lead a, a cannon or a shot on so it's just it's a it's a bit frustrating your opponent keeping the game tight and that is a great shot by the way by peter then especially going against the nap the run through cannon with there with left hand side and run through and off there was fantastic and he's back in again wasn't that an absolute peach of a shot on a snooker table, you see quite often the guys having more problems potting a ball along the ball cushion than across the, the top cushion. And that's because of the nap that was just mentioned there. And yet, Gilchrist coped with it and he might have forged a chance. Yeah, he'd, be, he'd be very keen uh, to get this yellow out, out off the side cushion. He's going to bring a, gather the ball together now, maybe. And he'd probably try and play a... Uh, a cannon off off the side cushion to bring the yellow out at some stage. He'd be keen to get the ball to the top of the table as quick as he can. Let's gather the balls in the centre of the table now, so he's got options here. And what is written in? Breaking news, Causia having his first, in quotes, bad game in about five years. He's beginning to know how us mortals feel. Well, that's probably true. You, you can probably count on one hand the amount of bad games Dave's had in five years. He's just been uh, phenomenal for a number of years now, how, how good he is. He's, he seems to win most events. Uh, he's just an absolute brilliant curist. So what are your plans now? Practice on for next year? Well, the next events, um, we've got like the English qualifiers next Sunday um, or up and down the country I'm up in Halifax some of them are back, some of the lads are back here uh, the next WBL event is uh, Carlisle uh, I think it's the 3rd or 4th of December it's the British Open so we'll uh, probably have a few days off and start practicing again next week got some good events I think it's and then January we're in up from Scotland end of January for the Scottish Open um, and I think it's an, uh, an event in Austria um, Jersey and back in Carlo in Ireland, which is my personal favourite event. We have the, the World Match Play, which is a 100 up event. That's a really entertaining format. Um, and it's a great venue, the, the SBI in, in, in Ireland, in, in Carlo. There's eight tables there, eight stars, and it's obviously four stars, four rassons, and the conditions are fantastic. And we get looked after the, the uh, Talbot Hotel, it's really good. Yeah, the star and the rasson tables are the tables used for all of the, the snooker events as well. The Rasson tables are used in matchroom events such as the Championship League, 
and the forthcoming champion of champions. We've got it Bolton in the second week in November. That's always one of the, the great tournaments to cover. I think the Rasson team was absolutely beautiful. I played so players first time I played them was um, was then back in in, um, in April in Carlo and absolutely looked I think they look fantastic, they play fantastic. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. They use the Rasson tables as well for some of the big matchroom pool tournaments, including the one in Vietnam where I was working last week. And the pool tables also play very nicely. So what would be thinking of possibly going to pop the red leading off um, into the into the right hand middle pocket uh, to leave a drop cannon and he'd be looking to say gather the balls at the top of the table he's making this break here but it's been all round I believe there's not been flown top um, it's been a bitty if you, if, if, you, if you know what I mean but um, certainly if Pete can get in this and make this turn this to a two or three under break that's going to be one big lead uh, and they will be able to say the pressure to pull off back even for even for this for the player as Dave is. I thought I'll put you on the spot here. Is this a crisis for Corsier? I wouldn't say crisis yet, but it's approaching one. Um, as I say, Dave's more than quite capable of just pulling out the bag. Even though, despite the fact he looks very frustrated, Peter's kept him off the table, and Peter's playing some brilliant match match play billiards here. He's all right there. Get a think, Cannon. If he plays this right, he can get thin on the red onto the yellow and then come back again with the cannon. And he could be a uh, plumb top of the table here. 39. Looks good, yeah. If he gets thin on the yellow here, push it back up to up, up towards the, the spot. And the red over the, over the corner pocket, he could be away here. It's a good shot. Richter 20 has come on the chat and told us I had the pleasure of refereeing Peter in the finals of the 2019 Pan Am tournament in Winnipeg in Canada he was a gracious winner and quite the gentleman yeah as we said before Peter Gilchrist he's an absolute gentleman win or lose he's, he's a fantastic guy great, uh, great to be around slightly underhead that one this leaves a tricky pot, this. Mm -hmm. The safety option has not gone as he would have liked. He's tried to leave the enough yellow. He's tried to hit a little bit thinner if he couldn't leave the enough enough uh, yellow into the right corner pocket. But he's uh, hit it wrongly. Probably the right shot here. Pop the yellow. Double, double balk Dave again. So he's coming back to the table to another double balk as he did his last visit. Which is going to frustrate Dave. And the time, see it keeps ticking down. Yeah, that's the word, isn't it? He's getting under Corsia's skin. The scoreline is getting under Corsia's skin. The way Corsia's playing is getting under his skin. It's all accumulating and making him feel maybe the world's against him. Yeah, um, you will be feeling like that. It's, everything seems to be going wrong. It's very bitty. He's used to just blowing people away. Uh, Dave, he's so good. Um, but this doesn't seem to be going to be in his day so far. Heath Savage has been in touch. Just to echo Peter's comments earlier, massive thanks to everyone involved with Landywood Snooker Club. I can only stay for the English Open, but best place I've ever played in. Yeah, fantastic venue. Been to some wonderful clubs around the world. The Academy of Spherical Arts in Toronto, Canada 
is right up there. In terms of the UK, and I'm not just saying this because I'm sitting here, but in terms of the UK, this is, for me, the best I've ever experienced. Yeah, totally agree with you. And everyone who's been here this week has said the same, which is being blown away out how it's immaculate. It's, you know, there's not a bit of dust anywhere. It's spotless. It's fantastic. Oh, Any chance for Dave? So we just got over an hour and a half here, so it's still plenty of time to to pull back 581 points, is it? And we'd love to see it go tight. Gilchrist would not agree. He wants to see the scoreboard become even more one-sided. But for everyone watching, a thrilling finish would be the icing on the cake. Yeah, a really tight game and a tight finish would be good for, I think, for the game itself, rather than a one-sided landslide, if you like. Um, you know, for anyone new to Billy's watching it, it can be quite exciting. Over the time formatting of it, if it's a really one-sided game, um, can't be much of a spectacle, but, uh, but if it's a really tight, edgy game, it's it's more interesting. Eleven. Dave, you can see Dave there. He's just he's lead, he's already anticipating. He's leaning over, wanting the ball in his hand. He just wants to get on with it. So he's coming to the table pretty cold. It will be a, a time in this match because it's it's a five-hour match. This could be it where Dave will. Will dominate the table and it'll be on at the table and scoring. Marizana is most dangerous. 18. Right now, he's got the blues, but we all know things can change if he gets some rhythm and change quickly. There was, a, there was a final couple, I think about 18 months ago, um, they played um, Rob, Bob Horn, in the fan of the British Open up in Carlisle. And Rob started off like a house on, on fire, and uh, had a, I think he had a, a 240 and a 270. And it was in a 90 minute, 90 minute final. And you, for most players, you know, yeah, that would be enough. But they've come back with a 300 odd and 200 odd, back to back and won. It was just phenomenal, you know. Yeah, Rob was mentioning that a little earlier this afternoon. <laughs> Well, thanks, Peter. Thanks very much indeed for your input there. Very knowledgeable. Now join me in the commentary box from all the way down in New Zealand. It's Wayne Carey. Hello, dear. Hello, dear, Mr. Phil Yates. How are you, sir? Yeah, very good, thank you. Very good. How are you? I'm brilliant. Thank you for asking. Now, um, this gentleman here, he has some person, not just a player, some person as well. He um, he he was in New Zealand uh, just a less than a month ago. He won the New Zealand Open. Now, uh, we've got tables like they've got here. We've got uh, the Paper Tally Club. We've got the we got eight brand new Shenda tables filled, and the pockets are very tight. And he got uh, he got a break of uh, seven twenty nine, a couple of five hundreds, um, and he was obviously he won the New Zealand Open. Now, I'm starting to find the secret of actually winning the World Champs. In two nineteen, Mr. Peter Gilchrist come New Zealand, played in the New Zealand Open billiards and won it. In twenty twenty three. Mr. Peter Gilchrist came to New Zealand, won the New Zealand Open, and it's going very nicely here. So anyone who wants to win the World Champs, come and play in the New Zealand Open. Just before the World Champs are held, it's that easy for them. Well, yeah, there is definitely a, a connection there, of course. I think it must be inspiring to visit the North and South Island and fly your trade and then come back here for the big one. Well, of course, have you been in New Zealand yourself at all? Unfortunately not. I would love to go. You've got to put it on your wish list. 
it's uh, it really is what everyone says it is. It's a wonderful country. Uh, the, probably the South Island is pretty than the North, but um, here we have he's obviously putting an extension on his queue. Um, have you had much to do with this gentleman at all, Phil? I've known him for. Uh, many a year, actually. I haven't seen him for quite some time until today, and we caught up very briefly between sessions. As you might expect, he was a little bit preoccupied, but he came over for a, a short chat. And there's no doubt in my mind that if he were to win this, it would be a phenomenal achievement, because as we've mentioned on more than one occasion, if he were to be crowned world champion today, he would be winning the world championship in four different decades. Wow. Wow. Look, he's a great ambassador for the game too. Um, like I say, he comes all the way down to New Zealand and plays down there. And uh, that is great. He, um, he's a full package actually. Just so you know, in New Zealand we call him Peter God Christ. G-O-D Christ. And uh, why not? Why not? He... Um, just great to be with. Now, obviously, you do a lot of uh, cue sport commentaries. Yeah, snooker and pool mainly. Okay, sure. So I knew one of your fellow countrymen very well, Dean O'Kane. Oh, yeah, well, he's, he's really our superstar in, in snooker. Uh, we've had plenty of people try since to go pro, but no one's actually made it. They, um, he did a very nice commentary with Mark Watson, if you want to look it up on YouTube, Mark Watson and Dean O'Kane. And uh, it goes for about 55 minutes and Dean explains how tough it was when he first started. He went to England at 17 and tried to become a pro and was. I believe you're 79 years of age, Wayne. That's not true. I'm 28. OK. Just so that we know. Um, and, of course... As you get younger the, in, in, in the game of golf, they try to get you to shoot your age. Um, I wasn't able to shoot my age, unfortunately. Uh, I'm not talking the 28 either, but um, you're still playing, still loving the game, and, um, and I intend to play while I can, Phil. Why not? By the way, another septuagenarian who's watching our coverage today unable to make it here because he's not feeling too well at the moment but we need to give him a mention Peter Ostrowski from Huddersfield Ozzy as everyone calls him in that part of the world now I'm sure he's really enjoying this but he won't be enjoying the way the score is going because his favourite player is David Corsier so Ozzy he needs to pull his finger out doesn't he Corsier he needs to get going well, the game's cruel because um, cause you're sitting there and he's getting cold. And when you get cold, as you probably know anyway, Phil, you get, when you're playing the sport, or probably any sport actually, you're sitting on the sideline and the other players on the table, you come to the table and everything just for some reason looks hard. Um, even when they're just your basic starting half ball. And then finally you do get your starting shot, but because you put so much effort into getting that shot, you really haven't set your second or third shot up well either. 29. Beautiful cue is this lad. I've um, just watched his cue action, just everything's, everything's virtually perfect. I've made the comment that if Peter Godcrest was a horse and was a stallion, he'd have four books every year. He, he would want all the all the all the prodigies to queue like this man. He got the glass of wine elbow, motorbike grip. He's rifle shouldered. See that the glass of wine elbow. The elbow doesn't move at all. It just simply goes forward, and I call that the glass of wine elbow. Um, actually, the ladies like that. A little bit of coaching at home, and the ladies like that. Well, I'll tell you what, if he keeps playing like this, it'll be the glass of champagne elbow because <laughs> he's motoring now. He is. He is. And after the shot, he's still there. He's not staying, he doesn't throw the cue in the air and clean the ceilings. 
watch the what the elbow perfect and watches the shot and it's slow to get up. You play you ever tried billiards yourself? Yeah? Never tried billiards. It's a game that I've always been entranced by the skill level is extraordinary the thing i find it amazing more than anything else having played a lot of snooker in years gone by is just how these guys concentrate so hard for such a lengthy period of time yes i've actually played six hour finals in new zealand um two hours bit of a break and then two hours and then another break and um it's quite taxing it's um yeah, on a Monday, honestly, I can be mentally spent. See that? Plays a shot, now stands up. No rush to stand up. Goes down, beautiful front hand, full hand on the table. And now with the red going in, that means that Gilchrist's lead is expanded to a very healthy 600 points. Yes. Mind you, we all know that David Coyser could do it. Um, he's very fast when he gets going, but like he's cold, and that, that we, and the game's cruel. You. When you're cold, the balls just don't run for you either. Um, Peter Gilchrist is a New Zealand favourite. There's no, I won't mess around with the comment. Of course, we all like David Coyser, but when Peter comes to New Zealand, most years we just so appreciate him coming down and spending time in our country. And explaining the game to us. He is literally the full package. Perfect ambassador for the sport. And of course, when you think of billiards and you think of New Zealand, you have to think of a certain gentleman called Clark McConaughey. Well, of course, he, he was obviously, he's probably the best player we've actually had. Um, and he, but he mainly concentrated on billiards because billiards was a decent living in those days. Um, and we had another one too, by the way. You may not have heard of Alex, a gentleman called Mert O'Donoghue. Of course, yeah. But, yeah. He was the first man ever to claim a 147 and a 1000 break. But because he worked in a snooker hall, he was considered a professional and couldn't play in the world tournaments. 74. Yeah, back in the day. A 147 was considered Nirvana, something out of the world. Now, in professional snooker, well, they happen very, very regularly. And at some point, maybe this season, or certainly next season, we're going to see 200th recorded on the professional tour. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Look, all you people watching this, you know how hard the game is, snooker, or billiards. You know how hard it is. And yet they're making this... 147 look easy now. I, I believe, and again, it's not meant to be a nasty comment, but I believe today's pros are a fraction better than yesteryear's. Because now, a 147, as you just said, Phil, they're, they're quite common. Um, I did have the pleasure of watching this gentleman get his 1,346 1, break in Hamilton back in 2007 in New Zealand, again, playing in the New Zealand Open. So again, if you want a thousand break, come to New Zealand. But um, yeah, so just a full package, isn't he? Yeah, the bump off the middle pocket there didn't help him greatly. Did he force this? Yeah. yeah it's, um, by forcing it makes it a wider loser, so it's... Ninety. And, and there's no reason why he can't keep going here. And now just 80 minutes left. That clock is ticking down. The pressure on Corsia increasing all the time. Well, wow. And of course, he's... he's um, look, at watch the elbow. See if it drops. See that? Stays there. Stays on the line too, by the way. That's a skill. It's a skill. People don't realise it. He's got the drop cannon, and they should virtually all be together again within a couple of shots, top of the table. So tell me, Wayne, when did you start playing this game? 
Good, interesting comment there. Um, I used to play rugby league, and uh, my dad didn't care what I played as long as it was league. It was that, was that type of era. And uh, one day I sort of went past the snickle. Of course, all, as you can imagine, I was a halfback. Cheeky's typical young guy, but cheeky. And the props would get me on the field. No matter how I sort of try to give them the odd little shot, they, they could get me. Then one day, um, up the road, they, you know, they had an RSA, and I just sort of wandered apart, and there was a snooker table there. I could hear the balls clicking, so I went in and watched. So then I started to play it, and uh, I was 16 years old. And I got a 92 at 16. Didn't know about safety, of course. All you did was pot in those days, because you're, bu- you're bulletproof. But here's the point, Phil. I had these props growing. I was, I was playing quite nicely. And I thought, wow, this is for me. This is a great game. And, um, yeah, and, and to be frank, um, I was getting three pounds a week with my dad in the butcher shop. And I could go down and play snooker at night, play six games. We used to play for five shillings. And one or six for the table. And... Three and six, you know, was yours, and I could win a win a guinea a night. So um, I become a multi-millionaire overnight. So you went from cutting up steaks to playing for high stakes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, oh, my dad. We had a fish and chip shop. Um, I became a butcher later on, and um, what it's a wonderful industry too. And it's been very kind to me. As we digress here, Gilchrist just keeps powering on. Looks so easy, doesn't it? You, everyone watching this, you know how hard this game is. Just beautiful chemist. Like I said, if he was a racehorse, a stallion, I'd be sending my mares to him. That looks so easy, honestly. Beautiful touch. Well, he's been around for... So long now, and definitely in terms of horse racing parlance, is a stayer. Yes, he is a very well done. Yes, he would be too. Yeah, he would be. He, um, he came up with um, one of the other great players, um, Mike Russell, him, and they were both sort of mates in their day in the Teesside area. And, um, and I don't know if you knew it all, but... but Peter's dad was a fireman, and apparently Peter, on the way home from school, would pop in and see his dad, and the, and the firemen's, um, you know, where his dad worked, they had a full-size snooker table. So Peter would play, I guess, snooker to start off with, but I think he switched to billiards, he just prefers billiards, and therefore he had that wonderful grounding on the, on the snooker table while he's waiting for his dad to finish his shift, it might have been 10 o'clock at night. And that's how he got the time to be able to play like this. But the other comment too is, you can have all these gifts, all these chances, but you have still got to be good enough. And he certainly is. Yeah, silky smooth. And we all know in Q Sports that you can have skill in abundance, but if you've not got the nerve and the temperament to deal with pressure, it's no point because you can't make the most of that skill. No, exactly. Fortitude is huge. It's underrated. We're all good. We're all good out in front, you know, and we're just flowing. But the moment the pressure goes on, that's what I believe makes the man, makes the player. The break goes to 132. His highest contribution so far today, 193. If he could stay at the table long enough to make a break in excess of 193 here, you might be getting to the point where the match is irretrievable. He's on the natural cross loser here. He obviously play this, I guess, for he hasn't gone up far enough. So he played another long loser and I would suggest probably the drop cannon again after that. So those would be his next two shots. Long loser, drop cannon or magic circle. Let's watch his elbow here. Mm. 
No, he's played for another reason. 141. And that's another thing too for people that don't play a lot of billiards. In billiards, when you go going off, you get the ball back and you can put it anywhere in the D. So if you, if you learn to play half ball, you just put it around, you put it... You've got the whole... Watch, watch where he puts his white here. The last in off wasn't the cleanest, but it struggled in off the jaw. Sure. And now he's yeah, looking he's, very good. He's setting this up for half ball. See that? He's got the whole D to work, and if he doesn't like it, he's still got the pot. Top, but now he's going he's gonna to play what we call magic circle. He put the ball up close to that area where he's now either side of the table. Yeah, there's your half ball, and now another loser. 147. And this, I would suggest, will go up near the middle pocket. Just caress, look at that, just caresses the ball. Yep. Now it's gone wrong, but he's got the proper cannon. So that's, that again, that's the first of the bellies. And it's nearly if only got the pot all safety. Whereas bellies, if you can get it wrong, you've got questions and work problems out, as well as getting something else working for you. There you go, he's in this nice way. He'd be disappointed with the way the yellow left the cushion there. I think he tried to do a squash cannon. Yeah, 12, 12.37. It's looking increasingly difficult for, for Dave. Rumpy Tortoise has come on the chat and said, is Dave allowed to concede? Well, I think that's a little bit premature. Uh, in Billy's, we don't actually do that. I've only really ever seen that once or twice, but never in the finals. Um, we sort of keep going right through to the end. As you should. As you should, yes. We're sportsmen. And that's nothing too. Um, I saw Dave um, Peter played some nice shots there, and and and, and Dave, that's Patsy's. Patsy's knee. Now you don't get that a lot of sports, do you? You appreciated the shot that that uh, Peter played. So Gilchrist now, a little over seven hundred in front. He, he's taking his time here, working it all out. Yeah, he's looking for an off yellow. He's got to be on the on the ball line where he touches the table. And if he gets that wrong, he's got the cannon. Yeah, he's got a clever shot, very clever shot. He's got the choice of the in off or the cannon on the red. Well, you were mentioning when you came in, Wayne, about the connection he's got to New Zealand. As soon as the, the New Zealander gets in the commentary box, he starts to buzz. <laughs> that was the best, best, um, yeah, we, we love him in New Zealand. He's, we just absolutely love the guy. He's, um, he's very good for the game. Perfect ambassador. It's not just being nice little candidate, but he's trying to work, trying to work a, a yellow hand red. He may do a skinny red here. Yep, skinny red, and there now he's got the pot. If you're watching billiards for the first time, I'm sure you're very interested, as I am, in all of the different terminologies, the descriptive terms for particular shots. 170. Is there any questions anybody please ask? Not that we know everything, but we've just got to know something. Well, you know everything, Wayne. <laughs> Could you please tell my wife that? <laughs> You're sitting there for the drop cannon. That's nice. Seriously, it's it's very strong. He's on a break, 173. And uh, probably the problem with billiards is 
it can be boring to watch. And that's a shame. The skill level is unbelievable. The enjoyment is as much as good. There, yeah, look at that. Beautiful touch. <laughs> Alex has come back and said, of course, your wife knows it all. She's well. She's that true? Yes, yeah, she is. She is. And uh, she's a very special woman, actually. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, um, she's Welsh. And sometimes we come over to play in the sports here. She stays with the family. She she does come quite often and watch me play. She's one of those special people that she can sit the whole day and watch everybody play, playing billiards. Um, we could be watching the snooker on TV at night at home, you know, like the world champs or, you know, any snooker, and she sits with him and watches the whole game. And, uh, yeah, she's a keeper. <laughs> yeah. So here's a magic circle coming up again. And you've got to be very confident here, Peter, will definitely break the 200. Will we see a 1,000 break? Well, I think at the moment, right now, Gilchrist would gladly settle for three or four hundred. That would seal the deal. Well, he's, he'd be disappointed with that. That's just gone a bit wrong. But it's, it's floating nicely. Let's keep coming white. Yeah, but it's, well, it's a little tricky, but he'll... Um, he nicely played. And that's his highest break of the match. Okay. Eclipsing mm. a 193. Mm. Well, a gentleman there has put it be nice to see a longer final. In the old days, back in the 1930s, they played for two weeks. They played um, two two hour sessions most days, or even two three hour sessions. And that's why the scoring was so high. The Clark McConaughey days, Walter Lindrum. And, um, and I think he paid one and sixpence to get in and watch. Nipens to one and sixpence, as I understand. And, uh, yeah, it was just, it was in another era. And a decent living could be made out of it. And um, I guess, too, in, in my era, they were considered dens of iniquities, really. Um, I never let my mum know that I was playing snooker at, at 16. Our tournament director has just given me a, a very useful note here. Tournament terms and conditions. A player who concedes a match before the end may forfeit ranking points and prize money. Now, one, no one's suggesting that David Corsi is going to concede. It was just a question from one of our viewers. But that's the way of the world in billiards. If you contravene the rules, it pays a heavy price. We're gentlemen in the game, honestly. Um, well, that's another thing, too. I've got lots of comments on, it, on our sport, meaning Q sport in general. Um, you take snooker. Um, sometimes you get, they get snookered, and the referee's got to put the balls back, and he does so, and the player will say, no, 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 it was harder than that. Now, you've watched a lot of sports film. Could you imagine a soccer player doing that? No, the only other sport that has any kind of equivalence to that would be golf. And, you know, there's a great quote from the great American golfer Bobby Jones. He moved a ball when he was in the forest. No one saw it, but he called the foul on himself, the penalty on himself. And he was praised in the, the press. And he said, why are you praising me? No one ever praises someone for not robbing a bank. Yeah. And, um, well... Well, straight away. I, um, I've got lots of friends who play job. I call it job because there's no K in golf and I like my little arguments. And, um, and of course, oh dear. What a mess that was. Right off the spot as routine as you like. You see him tap the table. Sportsmanship from, from, uh, from Dave there. Did you see him do that? Or? Yeah, it was lovely, yeah. Yeah, like I said, there's, um, I like to have my little bits of fun with guys with um, golf, or joff as I call it. Um, if you think about it, Five. there's 18 pockets. 
and he gets three shots, sometimes five, to put the ball in the pocket in this game, in sneak as well. You're getting holes in one in every shot. Now, this would be one of the great billiard stories if He's David Corsier were to put together a massive break here and get right back into the match, but do not write him off. Agree. Absolutely agree. 11. 64 minutes left. For him, that's an eternity. And what is the difference, 700? 13. Two for the price of one there. Yeah, 18. it is 738. Well, they average about six minutes a hundred. So I don't know if you knew that at all, give or take. So there's 18. still plenty of time. Lots and lots and lots of time. There's virtually a thousand break here if you can get it. And given the predicament he finds himself in, given the natural pace he plays at, if he is at the table for quite some time, the referee could be speeding around, maybe needing to try, change into some trainers. Well, that's another comment on the game. The referee is not allowed to speed around. He's to, to go at his normal pace. Did you know that? I did not know that, no. What happens in snooker, of course, in the shootout, which is our timed event, is that the referee does tend to speed up in order to facilitate players who are needing points quickly. Yeah, well, I think it's a bit of a bit of a different game than this, of course. Um, but understand your comment. But um, it, it, is, it is said that referees shouldn't speed up to help the players. To, he's the he's the referee in the same speed that he did for the whole game. That's that's a billiard. We must stress that it's still a massively tall order. He's got to the point, really, where he can't afford many more mistakes, if any. Correct. Correct, yeah. So a 700 lead is 42 minutes, give or take. Six minutes, 100. So... Sorry, 42 minutes, yeah. And there's still quite a few. There's still 62, so there's actually sp uh, 20 spare minutes for one of a silly phrase. You did right. If this was... To, oh, look at that. What a shame. Oh, he's playing for the United now. Guess said he was brilliant at this. Take a bow. Take a bow. That's a wonderful shot, David. What a shot that was. If this amounts to anything, we'll remember that one. Oh, yes, it was. Um, now, Giz said he was very good. The, the great Indian player, he played that very well, that shot, when he used to get down in trouble. It's getting very interesting. And we're just so privileged, so privileged. Now, do you notice Dave does, um, he's got a bit of a different killing action, but that's him. We're all different, thank goodness for that. But he, he can move quite a bit on the shots. He the other back up chicken wing. Did you see that, Phil? They're two very different techniques, aren't they? They are. He didn't, make, he didn't make a century in the first session, Corsier, unbelievably. 84 was his best, so it's been a case of waiting, waiting to get going, and maybe this is the moment. 72. You did right. This would really, really, this would really make some sort of a history be talked about for years. He's starting to cue better, have you noticed? He's just stroking a bit an hour, and he's... Um, he was looking a bit pale before, but he's starting to get a bit of colour back in the cheeks. 
under an hour to go. Hmm. Drop king of position. And he probably top of the table in two shots. Eighty, sport line warning at eighty. Looks easy, doesn't it, Phil? I was making that point earlier on, like all of the great players in any sport. Of course, he's got that ability to make the game look easy when we all know it isn't. So what's the mindset of Gilchrist now? He's just praying to get back to the table, presumably. Um, in this situation, all you're doing is just waiting for him to miss. He did right. Just, um, there's nothing you can do. All you can do is watch. 93. And of course, you need to remain mentally tuned in. You don't want to lose concentration sitting there. Definitely. 95. But that's a bit of a, yeah, it's just, um, wonder if he did the same show as before. No, he didn't, he tried to kill it. So there'll be a bit of a breather for him, man. Peter Gilchrist, Peter Godchrist. Yeah, the break ends at 95. Useful, but in these circumstances, not useful enough. And by the way, I think the referee's doing a wonderful job. He hasn't made a mistake at all. Um, Phil Day, Phil, it's, um, Phil Yates, it's been very nice meeting you. And I've heard you do the commentary with Paul in, in the Sneaker Shootouts. And um, I'm going to leave you now and put, in, put you into Nick Barrow, who is, who is one of the world's best coaches. Yeah, thanks, Wayne. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Cheers, Dan. Hope the journey back down under is a nice, smooth one and not too lengthy. Four. So as they swap headsets and Nick gets into position, Peter Gilchrist very much in position here for glory. Yes, it's interesting, <clears throat> Phil, the marked return to the default demeanor around the table for both players but for different reasons peter because the relaxation and knowledge he can afford mistakes dave because he can't afford any so there's no need to be nervous he just has to score everything and make every shot there was a a flicker of hope for the dave pausier fans that um that recent burst might build into something more substantial. Yeah, I think the salient word there, though, in that sentence was flicker. Yeah. But Peter looks markedly more relaxed. He's breathing more normally. His normal tempo around the table. Filling for Gilchrist. He's starting to feel as though he's got one hand on the trophy, the the John Roberts trophy. But on the other hand, there's always the, the trepidation of thinking, well, if I lose from here, I'll never forgive myself. So it's mixed emotions, if you like. 
those thoughts can come into players' minds. Taylor oh. versus Davis, 85 comes to mind. And was it 83, the UK final, Davis versus Higgins, 7-0 up, Alex won, um, even to the best of them. A huge lead can sometimes work against one's flow. Yeah, you see it happen occasionally in test cricket and golf. You see big leads in football matches go. Yeah, the thing to, is to ignore your lead and almost pretend that you're behind because big leads can cause you to do, to play the game in a different way than you normally do. Yeah, you, can, you can become protectionist, as it were. Yes, protecting the lead rather than going, going for the win. And the mind can do funny things because it's built to preserve energy, uh, not to perform. So survival instinct is save energy. And uh, we can tend to start shutting down in big leads. There's a co it's a common um, symptom in uh, club players where they'll say, oh, I get to 40, then I start missing because they're rushing or oh, I was 2-0 up and lost it just because they think they've won. The mind can do funny things. Yeah, and I think the worst kind of pressure is created by people who get to the situation where they start to think, oh, if I lose this, it'll be horrible, instead of thinking, if I win this, it'll be great. That was Stephen Hendry's greatest motivation when he was playing he's told me this on several occasions yes he enjoyed victory but it maybe lasted for half an hour and then it was sort of back to being on a, a level emotional playing field but if he lost he hated it it would be a feeling that he carried for days and maybe even a week so his motivation when he was playing was to win in order to avoid how badly he felt when he lost yeah, and, and some players are motivated by different things, Ronnie, more for enjoyment, Hendry and Davis, to avoid defeat. Maybe Mark Williams is more to play well or to, to win. Business people, sports people are motivated either negatively or positively. But either way, motivated significantly. So Gilchrist now just... Four points away from re-establishing a 700 buffer. 700 points in front he will be in a, a moment or so. That's some buffer. And interesting, I interviewed Peter back in 2005 in the UAE where we were, uh, I was head coach, Peter visited for a tournament with the Singaporean team. And one of the questions I asked him was, what was it like crossing the winning line for your first world title? He said, I don't know because it was a timed match and there is no definitive winning line in a, in a timed match. And the thing that he said to me was just to remain, whatever the score is, cool, calm and collected. And that is the state of mind that you see now. It's easy to do when you've got a 700 point buffer. Of course he lives and represents Singapore now and He's won a whole host of gold medals for them in the Southeast Asian Games and also the Asian Games itself. He's been to locations such as Laos, Indonesia, Myanmar, home soil in Singapore, Malaysia and the Philippines where he's won gold in SEA Games. Another world title and that will make big news in his adopted nation. loath to call it a little too early but I think he's pretty much there don't you one should never count our chickens but who would bet against it at any odds and without being too harsh and I think he would be the first to agree with this and we'll speak with the champion afterwards on the stream but Without being too harsh, he's in this very healthy lead without playing to his brilliant best. Well, I was speaking to Rob Hall about it in the uh, interval, and 
He said that a, a poor average at this standard is 35 or so no, over a two and a half hour session. And they were at, Dave was at 13 and Peter was at 20 odd in the first half of the match. And it, it, Rob said that uh, if you'd have told him at the beginning of the first session that he would average 20 and be 300 points ahead, he wouldn't have believed it, would have bitten your hand off. Alex has made a good point here right now with that clock ticking down. It's a double-edged sword, as Alex said. Gilchrist's points are going up. Time is running out. What do the viewers think about the shift in, in demeanour of the players over the last 60 minutes? and how the momentum has swung. Was it something you expected? My personal viewpoint on this is that unusually for a two session match, I think the most important session was the first. I think Corsier played so well below his best. It came as a shock to his system and he's been unable to shake that off. Yeah, and the relief Peter must have felt to be 300 ahead and, and at the table uh, with that sense of hunger and anticipation to continue the break in the second session would have been a huge relief. He probably felt as much relief to finish that 300 ahead as, as uh, winning a title in its own right. Sometimes you can play bad in inverted commas and just feel you've got away with it if the other, if the opponent doesn't uh, punish you accordingly. Gilchrist, 84. Three. Is this one last throw of the dice. Even by his standards, he would have to fly. what they call a country mile away. Actually, the, the yellow ball did not hit the jaw. It hit the cushion. I wonder if he got a kick. Because the well, I can only think off. so. I can only think so. But the way he put his cue down, I mean, you could see he almost wanted to concede there. The way he put his cue down was in disgusted defeat. Yes, he struggled today. There's no doubt about that. But I have to believe that particular shot wasn't his fault because 
it had all the hallmarks of a bad contact and hence the reason that the balls are being cleaned. Of course, by doing this, the time is been into. I think we can safely say that Gilchrist is going to be the world champion again. reached his first final way back in 1989. He won the title for the first time in 1994. Recaptured it seven years later. He was the world champion in 2013. And again in 2019. And now number five is only 40 plus minutes away this in many respects Nick might be the sweetest well I think the, the sense of relief you would feel having made so many mistakes in the first session and to still come away with a win would be he'll sleep very well tonight assuming he converts this He does have this wonderful stomp around the table when he's in, in flow and relaxed. Very tall individual with a, a really sound technique. He's one of those players who looks the part. It was interesting. First session, his, his bridge hand was noticeably moving on a number of shots, but that isn't happening so much now. No, that's all, often a sign of anxiety, uncertainty. But a 700-point cushion removes anxiety and uncertainty quite effectively. Yeah, this is a, a victory lap now, and the thoughts that must be going through his mind is a £5,000 first prize. And the utter satisfaction of being able to say, I'm world champion again. And he's part of an elite sports uh, scholarship program in Singapore where the top rated athletes on, on a world level within Singapore receive extra uh, support and mentoring and these type of results count significantly toward that ongoing support uh, continuing. KPIs they're called, Key Performance Indicators and Alicia's Yap, the, the former world number one, is also on that program from Singapore. I was speaking to Paul Lloyd, proprietor at Landywood Snooker Club. Just wanted to congratulate him on providing such a wonderful ambiance in in the club in the in the playing room. So much um, um, historical. What's the word? Not artifacts. Memorabilia on the walls, and it's. Um, very accomplished pro am player himself from the 90s. He was in, in 92, in Blackpool 92, the school of 92, as I was. So we shared a lot of um, pro am memories together. But he's done a terrific job here of showing utter dedication, providing a lovely playing environment here. Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, when Snooker went to open in the early 90s, another player to sign up was a certain Peter Gilchrist. He was on the pro circuit then. Was he there in 92 in black? Not sure about the specific dates, but he definitely played some professional matches around that time. But he's found his calling in the three ball game. And boy, is he looking good now. 
And he's also better than most snooker players who ever who have ever picked up a queue as well because he's had more than one one four seven on the twenty one ball game. So, Phil, when was your first commentary experience? It was the World Masters snooker at the National Exhibition Centre in January of 1991. Was it Mitre World Masters? Yes. And yes. John Higgins won the junior event? John Higgins won the junior event, indeed. He beat Mark Williams in the final. The main event was won by Jimmy White beating Tony Drago. And it was £200,000, wasn't it? That was the... That was the thing. It was a massive first prize then. But I think Tony only got 70. I think there was a huge discrepancy, or, or 50 or something like that. It's an enormous discrepancy. Well, you were right first time, it was 70. But there was also men's doubles, women's doubles, mixed doubles. I, I remember being there and, and thinking, oh, Ronnie's definitely going to win this one, the, the junior. But we were all surprised. Oh, who's this John Higgins lad who just uh, wiped the field? 86. Well, the sad thing about that was that Higgins won the junior earlier in the week, went back home north of the border, and he was supposed to come back to Birmingham to collect the trophy, and he was on his way down, and his manager had a, a puncture, so he never got to actually lift the trophy in the arena. But he won the, the £5,000 first prize, and... I think he's lifted a few trophies since. But did he get the money and did he get the trophy? Well, he got the money and the trophy, but not when he should have done an IE there and then and got the, got the adulation. Like it rolled onto the spot. 93. Now, we've talked a lot about Gilchrist, the way he's feeling as he approaches another century. Orsia, who is the defending champion, but his reign is about to be ended in 37 minutes. What must he be feeling like? Because it's a double whammy for him. Defeat and a very poor performance. In one sense, it might reduce disappointment because you don't feel you deserve to win. On another, it might increase it because you didn't give yourself a chance to win. 99. I'll tell you this, it just shows the, the fickle nature of Q Sports. When he arrived today, he would never have imagined in his wildest dreams, or more accurately, his wildest nightmares, that the, the game would go quite like this. An average of 13 in the first session. It would be like Ronnie not scoring a 40 break in a best of nine. But it's about self-management and self-recovery as well. And at this level, you can't continue to do that and get away with it. But they'll understand that at this level. And it's... I remember Ronnie said something that was... Before I think the UK final, which he beat Stephen Hendry in, in was it when he was 17, a, a very stoic statement before the final, may the best man win. And I think at this level, uh, you don't begrudge an opponent if you haven't performed. That was a smasher. But I think it's academic now. Well, there was no English or side on the yellow when it hit the jaw. Otherwise, it may have wriggled in. Thank you. 
Yeah, now physically impossible to make the gap up because an average for Dave is six minutes for a hundred break. Unless he can get some nursery cannons going. I think he's just trying to restore a degree of respectability to the score line, as they say, and give himself some self-esteem and make a big break, show what he's capable of. Although if he does make a big break here, I suppose that heightens the disappointment to a certain extent. Why didn't I do it earlier? That will be the, the thought process then. This is where you get all the fishing tackle out with extensions and double extensions. In fact, I wonder if he'll be able to reach this. It depends how long the telescopic is. Sometimes they're unreachable. Much like Gilchrist Total. I think that is an appropriate analogy. Peter's having a laugh and a joke with the audience. Hey, wouldn't have been doing that toward the end of the first session. Breathing easy. Oh. You can see there's quite a bit of steer on that after the shot. Knew he'd got the wrong contact. It's all fizzling out. Looks as though Corsier will win the high break prize with his 5.17 in the semi-final against Robert Hall yesterday. It's a pound a point, so that's 517 pounds you will receive for that. 2,500 as runner-up in the championship. But he's not been on the money today at all. The day of the World Billiards Championship final is not the best time to have an off day. Eight. <laughs> how many camaraderie going on? Yeah, how many times has he come to the table with the white and the red in Balkan? All he can do is that. <laughs> Plenty of English Three. to run the white in. Left-handed. This to bring up 1,500 points. I think given the scoring in the previous rounds from both of these two, it's been definitely a, a low-scoring match when you consider in the quarterfinals he has scored 1,808 in the last 16, 1,638, and in the semi-finals, 2,073. Also in his semi-final, Gilchrist scored 1,882. Over how many hours? A shorter match than this. I think mathematics, I think averages, high breaks, all of that, it won't mean an awful lot to Gilchrist. He's just happy to be wearing the, the crown again. And bring more sporting glory to the state of Singapore. Four. Six. 
It would be the ultimate cruelty for David Corsier in many respects if he ran out here with a very big break and it was all to no avail. Well, that might have put the kibosh on that particular possibility. But that's not bad. 22. Of course, he could still beat his own high break, which would be a little more remunerative. He remunerative. Might earn, he might earn himself an extra fiver if he scored. <laughs> yeah. Well, the five is a fiver, Nick. <clears throat> I'm just trying to instill something meaningful into the, the dying moments of this match, which we all know is over. Oh, well, this could be clever. Just needed a half full contact to make a lovely cannon. He's 55 years of age now, Peter Gilchrist, so to regain the title, that's a real feather in his cap. And still with the youthful sense of humour and disposition that he's always had. Eight. Yes, 29 years after he was first crown world champion. Ten. He's going to have the same experience. So the gap between his first and last world title was more than the gap between being born and his first world title. Ten. Yeah, he was 26 when he originally lifted the trophy. It is good to have the non-concession rule uh, because that can take away something from the audience's enjoyment and appreciation of the skill of the players. Because one of the comments earlier was that that rule was brought in after, I think, Mike Russell conceded early with 40 minutes ago against Sarav Kathari. In I forget the year, but um, then the rule quite rightly was brought in. I'm going to hand over. Thank you very much, Phil. It's been a pleasure. As always, Nick, thank you very much indeed. So joining me in the commentary box now is Chris Kumu, who's a director of World Billiards and doing a fine job here. Hi, Phil. Yeah, thanks a lot. And uh, great to have you here as well. And this has been uh, an interesting final, hasn't it? I mean... Well, it goes without saying, really. I mean, obviously, Corsi will be disappointed, but Peter's just been playing pretty solid, not to his, you know, fast-flowing sort of huge breaks that we normally see, but just sort of, well, you, you can't argue with the result, can you, really, for so far? And obviously, it's just a case of playing out time now. Yeah, missed that cannon. He's missed a few, actually. And in that particular segment of the table, quite often he's missed them by going a little wide, but in the end, it's not cost him. So how's the tournament been for you in general? Yeah, we've been delighted really of everything. I mean, the, you know, as we've mentioned, the Landywood Snooker Club is just a, an amazing venue. The staff have been fantastic right from the word go, really. As soon as they agreed to host it, it 
you know, they couldn't have been more supportive. And uh, yeah, we've had some great feedback and great support, players and officials. So on the whole, it's been a great event, really. I mean, it uh, doesn't feel like a year ago that we were in Singapore for this event. And, you know, it's uh, plans are, well, starting to be uh, considered for next year, but uh, watch this space on that one. But yeah, no, brilliant event. As good as the venue is, and it's exceedingly good, I think it's fair to say that David calls you from his demeanour once out. You can see he's just desperate for this clock to run down and get what has been a horrible match for him out of the way. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I mean, he'll, he'll obviously be disappointed. But, you know, Dave's just a class act and I'm sure he'll, uh, you know, reflect on, obviously, you know, the event. I mean, and, uh, you know, come back stronger. But the, the next event is uh, the British Open in Carlisle, well, the next UK event that we'll see Corsia playing in and Gilchrist. So, sure, we'll be back stronger, but, um, yeah, it's always tough, I think, when you're in this situation with, with just the time ticking down. And, and hope completely gone. Yeah, absolutely. It's one of those football cliches, isn't it? Perhaps the best known of the lot, a game of two halves. But this has been one of those finals where I think the most important session was the first. Gilchrist building that 300 point lead. Causey not playing well at all. And I think that had a very significant effect on the overall result. Yes, Gilchrist has improved in the second session and pulled away, but I think the seed of doubt was planted in the mind of Corsia early on. Absolutely, yeah, I think you're right, Phil. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, he, I know, uh, you know, obviously Dave was, would have still believed in himself, I'm sure, you know, he's got tremendous belief in his ability, but just, um, you know, he just couldn't seem to do it on this occasion, really. And obviously, yeah, as you say, Gilchrist had just pulled away, really, now in this second okay. session. So, uh, in good position at the top here, just the little uh, yellow to red cannon. Should uh, get back into prime position again. Just their control at the top is just uh, incredible to watch these guys. The last time he lifted the John Roberts Trophy was in 2019. It was over in the RACV club in Melbourne, Australia, beat Saraf Kathari, 1,307 to 967. This one is going to be more comfortable, and I would hazard a guess, considering the fact he's playing Corsia, the defending champion, that this one will be very sweet indeed. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and um, as and as we mentioned, you know, Gilchrist will be the uh, would have won this championship in four different decades, which is just incredible. Uh, you know, achievement really. Um, yeah, Gilchrist will be just over the moon, um, but you know, to, uh, to get his uh, name back on that trophy. And with his technique, his enthusiasm, with his experience and know how, who's to say he can't win the world title in five different oh, decades? Absolutely. He's still just, yeah, playing, you know, just as good as Emma, really. I mean, it uh, doesn't seem to be any sign of any of any um, s sort of uh, slowing down of his ability, does it? 70. The pace of Gilchrist has now increased because he knows he's got threes away. 73. Uncatchable. Yeah, who's to say you can't remain at the table now for the remainder of the, the session and the match. Certainly in prime position now. Postman's knock, the yellow tight on the top cushion. Well, when the, the postman knocks next, for him it's going to be an envelope with £5,000 in it. That's the first prize here. I think it's going to be the cash, is it, Chris? It's going to be a cheque, but... <laughs> or, or bank transfer. Bank transfer. <laughs> That's absolutely, yeah. 
Yeah, that's... Um, 89. Yeah, just... You know, it's just been, uh, well, just solid. 92. 94. Don't do what they did with Mark Williams all those years ago when he won the Masters and 96. they sent the the check and it was a check then to the incorrect Mark Williams. There were two players on the circuit of that name and they sent it to the wrong address. <laughs> and that's why you might see him play now with the name Mark J. Williams. That's why the J's there to differentiate from the other one who doesn't play anymore. Amazing. And how's this for ill fortune for the game's governing body? The reason the story came to light, the Mark Williams who erroneously received the money was actually playing snooker in a club where there was a, a journalist and he mentioned this and that's how the story got out. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, times have moved on slightly, but... <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> but uh, that uh, run through and off there just... Uh, Clip the jaws, but not much that uh, Cordia could do of that white there. Three. Nice, uh, nice and controlled stunning off there. And uh, we need, maybe if he gets deep into the jaws, he may be able to sort of remove that white away from the pocket, but it is, it's look like it's any sort of contact is just going to knock it further, well, either into the pocket or. Well, I have seen a couple of shots this week where they've managed to play a cannon and move the white away, but I don't think there's much you can be doing with that, just playing a few shots off the red one. Uh, uh, no option really other than a cannon or pot white here. So going forward, he's right at the top of the tree, Corsia. You know he's going to win a boatload of tournaments. I think the best advice I would give him for today is just write it off as a bad day at the office, don't read too much into it. Yeah, I think that's right, yeah. I mean, obviously he knows that, you know, Gilchrist is a top-class player. We've got a lot of respect for each other. And, um, yeah, of course, he'll be disappointed, but we'll, uh, we'll be seeing plenty more of Corsi, I'm sure. It's, uh, Peter attempts to uh, go around the table, disturb the balls. But... They see the, you know, they know that it's uh, the time is ticking down now. And this won't be the first time that Peter Gilchrist has beaten David Corsier in a World Championship final, 2013 at the Northern Snooker Centre in Leeds. Gilchrist prevailed, 1,500 to 1,085. This, well, right now, even more comprehensive. Nice little double kiss there, just to uh, on the cannon there from Corsier. It's getting a little bit tricky now. This uh, roll in the red into the middle. Never easy, especially in this stage of the match. But yeah, I'm sure it's uh, Corsier is obviously just. I'm sure he's still you know trying his best, obviously Friday performance and everything, but. Yeah, but you do get to a stage where as that unbelievable cannon comes off. You do get to a stage where it's human nature to be demotivated. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I'm not saying that he's conceited or anything like that. I'm not saying he came in today thinking, I'm going to win this, but he thought he'd got a wonderful chance to do so. And those dreams have been evaporated just thinking about that first 15 minutes or so first half an hour or so we didn't really read an awful lot into it but basically that established the pattern of the whole day 
Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it was sort of, um, uh, you know, we had a bit of a scrappy start, I guess. And, um, yeah, like you say, it, it never sort of developed into a fully sort of, you know, a big breaks sort of making that we that we often see with, um, with these two top players. I think it was understandable for us to fall into the trap of thinking it was merely teething problems at the start of a lengthy match. But while Gilchrist sorted himself out Corsia never found the fluency with which he's associated and look at this now the lead over 900 yeah Peter just happy just to play a few uh, in off Yolo just let his cue arm go normally you know or the normal sort of uh, pattern of play here would be to try to get the red back into open play into a good position as soon as possible but he's just happy just to run this yellow up and down a few in offs not quite gone far enough for a middle pocket in off here so long loser it is a long loser from the winner in 13 minutes time <laughs> Going back to what we were saying about the about Gilgris having won this title in four decades, if you actually count finals, it would be five decades because in 1989 he was the runner up to uh, Mike Russell. So, some going really, so just an incredible career he's had and still having. Another very classy cannon, especially promoting the red over the pockets. I think this is another sporting reminder that favourites aren't necessarily certainties. David Corsia was the favourite to win this match, and yet he's been lapped. Left-handed one there. Oh, nice cross loser now. Send the red up to the middle. Yeah, he'll be uh, well. He'll relax more when the bell goes, but I think we'll be feeling pretty relaxed now, Peter. And now all of this is academic. I can tell you a little bit about the trophy. Now, Chris gave me this information. The John Roberts Trophy Fact Sheet. It's the Championship of Billiards Challenge Cup, which is now known as the John Roberts Trophy. Manufactured in 1870 by Edward Barnard and Sons of London. It's 90 ounces. Height, two feet six inches. Materials, solid silver, finished with mercury gilding. Its original cost was 100 pounds. Now, in 1870, 100 pounds, that was a lot of money. <laughs> exactly. I wouldn't like to put a price on it now, though, Phil. <laughs> the figure on top of the trophy is mercury, following a design by John of Bologna. On each side of the body sits a figure of victory, or fame, extending a laurel wreath with one hand and offering a Maltese cross with the other. Originally won in 1870 by William Cook. And now, all of these, all of these years later in 2023, it's about to be won by Peter Gilchrist. By the way, David Corsier, there's the trophy in question. He's got a unique association with the John Roberts Trophy. He's won it four times in three different competitions. He first won it when it was presented for the B and SCC Amateur Billiards Championship of England 
in 1994 and again in 2013 when he won the English Association of Snooker and Billiards National Billiards Championship. And then 2015, 2017, he was awarded the, the John Roberts Trophy for winning the WPBSA World Billiards Championship. But he's not going to get his hands back on the trophy today. It's been relinquished. His reign as champion is over. Yeah, it's, it's an incredible trophy. I mean, I was having a closer look at it the other day, and just the the, the sort of detail is incredible. I mean, on the on the back of the trophy, there's like a an, an engraving um, of like a billiard scene of a billiard you know table. And you can even see the scoreboard and the two players playing like a you know incredible really. I mean, obviously some fantastic names in there as well that have won it, as you say, in the various competitions that it was uh, used for. And, but it's great to see. It back being the main trophy for our Blue Ribbon event, World Billiards Championship. Fantastic. Yeah, it's entirely appropriate. And there we see the bulk line crossing. Pretty classic crossing that. Side cushion, bulk cushion. Then the two side cushions and the cue ball just checks up nicely. Frack in prime position. Something that these guys have just perfected over the years who can uh, be pretty sure that if they get the right angle on the red to play that shot, it's just second nature to send that cue ball around and almost to the position you'd put it by hand if you were to place it for the next shot. Yes, and now less than a handful of shots away from having a 1,000-point lead. Who would have thought that before play got underway? Yeah, it's incredible, really. Um, yeah, we were obviously expecting a closer match, I and mean, we know that um, you know, as with, just with these top guys, they're both capable of doing this to each other. And, you know, the same thing could happen in another final, the same length, and you know, it, it could be roles reversed. But on this occasion, just Gilchrist uh, having a success. Yes, we always knew that Gilchrist was very capable of gaining the victory today we thought if someone was going to win by a hefty amount it might probably be David Corsier but the boots on the other foot yeah it is good to see uh, Peter Bat playing well again obviously you know two top class players and uh, I mean I, I think we've, we've I don't have the stats of how many times these two have met in, in finals and especially major finals you know of, of all the various ranking tournaments but or what the head-to-head -head would be, but uh, very rarely disappoints and, uh, you know, just two legends of the game. Just And now you can just feel it. You can see it. Gilchrist enjoying himself. Needed to hit the yellow a little thinner than that, so it's at the break. Yep, so roughly six minutes to go then, and uh, this calls your attempts that cannon. Difficult to know exactly where the balls would have ended up there, but managed to leave himself uh, what looked to be a half ball in off. So at the end of proceedings, Chris, I'm led to believe we're going to have the historic, famous and very valuable trophy handed over. And once the presentation is done, and you'll see all of that, then the champion, Peter, will join me behind the microphone. We'll do a, a Q&A for a few moments, and then we'll, we'll sign off. Absolutely, and it's been great to see, um, you know, all the support, the comments on YouTube, Facebook, and a lot of activity on social media and it's you know great to see and um you know all the uh, recordings from the world championship table one matches they're all on youtube so do feel free to look back on those it's been some great action over the last four days well indeed the last six days with the english open which uh, calls it one at the weekend here yeah the 
the stay in the West Midlands for Corsi has started according to plan, but it's not ended that way. Yeah, and I mentioned also for Chris Ellis, the referee, and Stephen Harrison, the marker, they've done a great job, and both of whom are, you know, very active on the billiard scene with WBL and after tournaments in England like the EABA. So it's been a long uh, six days, really, lots of, um, you know, long days for the referees, but they've done a cracking job, and uh, great to see the referees from Singapore and, and Korea as well here supporting this event. They call it the the three ball game right now it's just two balls David so a little over three minutes to go here's Gilchrist going to stay at the table now until the bell goes and the trophy returns to his possession. Two. Five. Yeah, great pot and I'm sure everything feels easy now. Eight. Seeing him pop that red to middle. Early in the first session, he missed a red to the opposite middle pocket. It was a real surprise when he was very nicely in. And we wondered then aloud whether that was going to be a turning point. The fact it wasn't, I think, sums up the day for Corsia. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting how, when you look back, certain certain shots can, can you know, can, because you think they might, you know, cause a turning point, but even in a long match, that you know those things can, uh, can can change how the match flows. Twenty. Twenty-two. What a lovely feeling. There's a, a famous baseball player in the bygone days when the New York Yankees were in dominant form. A gentleman known as Yogi Bear, who was the inspiration for the cartoon character Yogi Bear. And he was known for his rather strange quotes and malapropisms. And one of them was, well, he was the first player to say, it ain't over till it's over. But this one is. Yeah, it certainly is, Phil. And not, not too long to go now, just the last minute or so. 33. Yeah, the bell is going to ring, but David Corsi is not going to be saved by the bell. But you know you're going to come back next year in 12 months' time or whenever the championship is in 2024. You know you will come back and be very hard to beat. Absolutely, yeah. Dave's a class act, and I know he works so hard at the game. And I'm sure it won't be too long before he's back at the practice table again, putting in all those hours. And getting his uh, hands on a trophy again. 47. 49. Like the old days. 51. Yeah, a few little close cannons. Checking for a touching ball, not quite. 53. And now we know he is going to win by more than 1,000 points. Fifty-nine. I'm from Massey. And there it is. The match is over. What a performance from Peter Gilchrist. He was the second favourite coming into the match. Everyone assumed that he had the 
know-how, the ability, the experience, and the pedigree to win. But we also thought, well, David Corsier is in such fine form. He's made so many big breaks. He's made the biggest break of the tournament so far. He dominated his semi-final. He's the defending champion. He's the one to beat. Well, he had a very much an off day and Peter Gilchrist took full advantage of that. In the end, the final score, Peter Gilchrist representing Singapore defeats David Corsier of England, 1,824 to 783. I think everyone would agree that was quite comprehensive. Absolutely, Phil, and um, yeah, fully well played there to uh, just solid performance all round. And yeah, hard luck to Dave, but I'm sure we'll see him back stronger than ever. Frank Bradley's in there with Jason Colbrook. The trophy is about to be presented, and again, we must say, what a wonderful trophy it is. when they're not refereeing so you know helping out for the, the running of the tournament so yeah fully grateful for all the support of all the referees it takes uh, a lot of dedication and concentration Paul Lloyd the club owner presenting his memento to Chris Ellis who has just refereed his first ever world billiards championship final and there's the, the tournament controller, the man who went to school with not one, but two members of the Beatles. Well, that's, uh, that's amazing. I mean, I didn't actually know that, Phil, so that's uh, an interesting bit of information there. We did the first segment of the commentary, Jason Colbrook and I, and the managing director of World Billiards. And there's the, the trophy over to... Peter Gilchrist. No wonder he's smiling. He's been in this position before, but when you get to the age of 55 to be a world champion, that really is something else. David Corsier had a day that he will want to immediately forget. Nevertheless, he made the highest break of the tournament, 517 in the semi-final against Robert Hall. And you just know with his innate ability. It's only a matter of time before he's back in the winner's circle. Five seventeen, Chris, is a, a really good number, isn't it? Incredible, yeah. Just top class and uh, just so much concentration required. But to these guys, it's just second nature. Conditions have been fantastic. I think a lot of credit has to go to Peter to the performance because I was standing. He kept me out for long periods and didn't give me a chance. I know that's his job, but it's not as easy as everyone thinks it is. Uh, just big work to Peter, new champion. Well done. Congratulations, great fella, an awesome player. Champion. Fifth time he's won it in four different decades, which means he's very, very old. That's very lovely. Thank you. Hello, Pop. Thank you. I'll craft pictures with you of the trophy on your own. Yeah. Oh, no cause for satisfaction. <laughs> Stop trying to get in on my app. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll take the photographs. This is a day that when he retires from the game, he'll look back on with immense pride. As you must, Chris, for putting together such a, a terrific tournament. Yeah, it's been fantastic, really, and uh, it's it's going to be a memorable memorable event. And um, you know, it's great to hear the the feedback from players, and they've had a fantastic time. And yeah, of course, uh, no, nobody would be more happy than Gilchrist at this time. 
shirt in Singapore, which I wasn't very happy about. <laughs> uh, but uh, he played fantastic over there. And um, he just didn't really get going today. I think if he did, it would have been a, a different story because I didn't play as well as I, I maybe could have done as well. Uh, but well done, Dave. I'll get to the final. Good, good achievement. Um, the club, what to say about this club? It's fantastic, isn't it, Paul? Uh, you've done us proud, and uh, I hope that we can come back uh, again. No chance. No chance. <laughs> no chance. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, and it's just so nice to see uh, people watching this, uh, this beautiful game. Uh, I don't think it gets the recognition that it deserves. You know, we, we see pool, we see yeah. snooker, we don't see a lot of billiards, and uh, let's just hope we can uh, try and get it on television again. Um, I hope that Rex gets better. Rex Williams was uh, meant to be here today, commentating and also presenting the uh, trophy. So if you're watching Rex, um, I'm going to give you a call. Dad wants to give you a call as well. So um, I haven't spoken to Rex for a long time, but uh, what a great ambassador Rex was for the game. And, uh, and when he was chairman, he made sure Billiards uh, was championed and uh, we need that back again. So, um, so get well soon, Rex. And a big hand for Rex, please. <laughs> Final referee, uh, Chris, you were absolutely fantastic. Didn't put a foot wrong. Uh, it, it makes it a lot easier for the players when you're in their rhythm. There wasn't much of a rhythm today, but you were just with the players and it was uh, really, really well, well done. Uh, I know it's your first final, uh, and um, I was going to say many more to come, but I like Stevens looking and the friends. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. But well done, Chris, uh, and, and also all of the referees, all the officials. Uh, especially Frank as well, He's just, uh, he runs a fantastic tournament, um, nothing really goes wrong, you know, uh, he's cool with a cucumber, uh, <laughs> he's got a great singing voice, which he'll be singing later for you. <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, well done to our, our referees uh, from yeah. Singapore as well. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That speech, well, it's continuing here, tells us just how experienced he is in this kind of situation. Committee, I know they probably get a lot sicker for, for no reason whatsoever. You know, look at this guy, he's working tirelessly. Wow. <laughs> he makes you that he's seen, though, you know. Some people do it away from the table, but he's like, well, oh, you're down there. But there's uh, Chris, um, uh, Chris Coon, there's Darren Clark, you know. I was talking to Paul uh, at the beginning of the week here, and, uh, and it was a good mate of mine, Paul Collier, who, who, who mentioned about getting here, and yeah. Jason Ferguson, so a uh, big, big uh, hand to Paul for, uh, for recommending this club. Um, what you need to do is get a hotel just nearby, yeah. and then that'll be perfect. <laughs> you know, we'll be here all the time. We'll so, work on it. Yeah, all right, great. Um, yeah, uh, safe journey home, ev at home everybody. Well, we've um, still got one lot of certificates. All right, okay, am I giving yeah. these out? Oh. No, I'm not. No, Frank has done it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So, yeah, um, thanks for watching. I uh, hope we're here again next year, and uh, safe journeys home. Yeah. <laughs> So the champion is crowned, the tournament is over, but the coverage of the tournament isn't quite over because we do have the newly crowned champion coming in to speak to us in just a few moments. The, the table isn't too far away, actually, from our commentary position, so he'll be with us shortly. Just a reminder of what he's done here. Well, he made two double centuries in beating Barry Russell in the last... 16, 1,117 to 357. Then in the quarterfinals, he overcame Martin Goodwill, 1,156 to 326. Semi final, it was a win over Peter Sheehan of Liverpool. Again, by over 1,000 points, making a succession of high breaks. One, two, three, four breaks over 200 in that victory. Another four centuries as well and today i suppose you might say his standard dropped a little even though he's just been crowned world champion but it was more than enough to overcome david causier the title holder 
He was 300 in front after the first session and pulled away in the second. And here is the man in question. Get close to the microphone, yeah, sure. Peter. I know you're close to the trophy now, so get close to that microphone. <laughs> yeah. Tell us a little bit. There you go. I'm not sorry. Yeah. Tell us about the match, how it all went. It was a, a strange one, particularly early on in the first 20, 30 minutes. We were saying, well, both players are having teething problems. It's only a matter of time before they start to get going. And while you did, David didn't. That's right. Um, and to be honest, I didn't read the get going as good as I, I could, but I just kept it pretty tight. Um, I slowed it down a little bit. You know, I'm more, more of a rhythm player than that. Um, and uh, yeah, David just didn't get going. Um, I got a good run. Uh, didn't play as well as what I've been doing all week, to be honest. Uh, but just battled through it. And sometimes you've got to do that to win games. You know, it's, it, yeah, it's great to just play fantastic billiards and, and it's effortless. But sometimes you just got to dog it out. And, and that's what I did today. You know, everything seemed to be difficult. It was all in offs. And I got them down the top and making silly mistake after silly mistake. Just didn't seem to be going well. Um, you know, so it's a tough game. You know, when you think about it, I've been doing this for what, 43 years now. And, um, you know, wh when you see the top players playing well, it does look very easy, you know. But, you know, you, you saw there, it can be a very difficult game as well. The most important visit, from my perspective, amidst all of that disjointed play early on, the 193, you made the highest break in the first session. And then you led by 300 going into the the second session and you were at the table as well maybe that was the most important break of the entire contest yeah maybe um yeah i can't really remember that phil but yeah uh you know going going being 300 ahead after the first session and the way i played and i was in position uh, i was very happy about that and i know david would have been uh, really disappointed to be 300 behind the way i played I think it could have been level, you know, and like you say, if I didn't make that 190 break or something, yeah, that might have been the, the crucial one. Yeah. Against someone like David, who's so brilliant and who's so instinctive and can score ridiculously quickly, was there any predetermined game plan? Definitely. You know, I, I watch David play, and when we play these group games, he's playing players who, uh, no disrespect to these players, but they can't make a, a 50 break. And so Dave's just uh, in his flow. It doesn't matter if he if he misses, because the guy's not going to come in with a, a big break. Whereas Dave, if David misses against the likes of myself, in the back of his mind, he's maybe thinking, Peter could knock a five or six hundred break in here. Now I didn't there, but it's always in the back of your mind. And um, you know, yeah, he's, he's an instinctive player. Uh, he gets into a fast flow, and I just thought, right, just uh, just slow it down and uh, try not to miss as many silly shots as I normally do. But I, I still missed a lot. Yeah. But you weren't slow. You were just slower than normal, I suppose. That's the, the best way of putting it. Yeah, probably. Cheers. Thank the Guinness for me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you've get deserved you, it. I'll get you on the bit, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> so we were talking before about the fact you've now won this world title in four different decades, which is a remarkable which achievement. Which means I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> 1994 was the breakthrough. Then, of course, you've spread them out since then. Was this one of the sweetest? Um... Yeah, it's nice. This, this was a nice one. It was a nice one in 2019. Uh, as you know, there's a few uh, few things going on with the game, their own politics, and we haven't got the Indian players over. In 2019 in Melbourne, we had uh, every all the best players in the world, you know, like some Mike Russell, Pankaj Jarvani, Saurav Kathari, all the Indians, uh, all the Australians. And so that was probably sweet because I knew that every player was there. For this one, there's a couple of Indians missing, so... Although it's very sweet to, to win it, you know, my, my fifth one. Um, very nice. But the 2019 one was probably a, a greater achievement. And I was thinking there at the end, I got that stat sheet about the John Roberts Trophy and the history of it. It must be wonderful to get your hands on that particular piece of silverware because it really is silver. It really is special. Uh, I won it in, like I said, 2019. And uh, my club back in Singapore, the cricket club, they have a glass cabinet there with all the trophies and they've got some spectacular trophies there as well but this one it just top trumps everything it's uh, it's probably it probably is the best trophy in WPBSA it's better than the World Snooker Championship it really is special isn't it Phil? Absolutely yeah. Yeah. and I was thinking you know it's really interesting talking about precious medals you've won silver today but you've also become very famous in Singapore for winning a, an array of golds in the Southeast Asian Games and the Asian Games themselves yeah, I've managed to win seven of them, and uh, you know, I, 
Ronnie O'Sullivan was over just a few months ago and I said to Ronnie, I said, have you ever won the BBC Sports Personality of the Year? He said, oh, no. So well, I've been Sports of the Year in Singapore twice. He's like, oh, yeah, that's good, isn't it? So, and it is pretty special for a billiards player to be Sports Personality uh, or Sports of the Year. Um, it's just, you know, fair play to Singapore for re recognising that billiards is a fantastic sport. Uh, you know, you've got to be quite good at it and... and uh, and so, yeah, that's a, that, that was a great achievement for me, like winning Sportsman of the Year. Like, that, how would that happen in England? You know, a billiards player winning Sportsman of the Year. Hello. <laughs> it just doesn't happen, does it? But it's fully deserved because not only are you a, a wonderful player and a serial winner, you're also a very good ambassador for the sport, as everyone has been saying who've been joining me in commentary today. So every congratulations for winning this world title. One final question. Will you be back next year to defend? No, I won't. Of course. <laughs> yeah, can't wait for it. I hope it's here as well. You know, it's a lovely club that Paul's got, isn't it? Uh, so it's... nice, yeah. And it, uh, a bigger question, are you going to be doing the commentating next year? If it doesn't clash, of course, I would love to come back if I'm invited. I've really enjoyed today. I know oh, nothing good. about the, the niceties of billiards or anything like that. I'm like a fish out of water. I made it plain right from the start I was a rookie, so I didn't want to get the situation where people thought I was some kind of expert and then put my foot in it. But I've really enjoyed the experience, and I'm delighted for you, Peter. It really is a wonderful achievement. Thanks a lot. Congratulations. Cheers. Thanks, Phil. Thank you. So there it is from the champion. You heard his dissection of the match. He is the 2023 World Billiards Champion, Peter Gilchrist. From myself, Phil Yates, and all of my guests today, a big thank you for watching and we'll see you next year.